Good afternoon and welcome uh, to this uh, Humane Philosophy Project Ian Ramsey Center seminar on naturalism, the penultimate installment this year. Uh, I'm Miko Iswavkovsky Rode, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Humane Philosophy Project, um, which is very grateful for the possibility of collaboration with the Ian Ramsey Center on this series. And it's very heartening to see so many of you here on such a beautiful May afternoon. It seems that uh, uh, intellectual hardship uh, and uh, um, uh, labor is, has still something to offer against the joys of uh, being out in the sun. Um, so let me hand over to Alistair McGrath, who's the director of Ian Ramsey Center, to introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Roger Trigg. And what I want to do, if I may, is kind of a lay context. We're going to be listening to Professor Trigg talk about his new book. And what I want to do, if I may, is just say something about Professor Trigg by way of appreciation and also by way of introduction. Professor Trigg has had a very distinguished background, a professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick, and then a long history of engagement with the field of science and religion, and particularly with the Ian Ramsey Center here at Oxford. And if I may embarrass him a little bit, I mean, he played a very important role, I think, in um, getting the Ian Ramsey Center to think seriously about applying for very large grants. I'm thinking of the period between uh, my distinguished predecessors, John Hedley Brook and Peter Harrison, where Roger Trigg very kindly acted for one year as the director of the Ian Ramsey Center. And during that year, um, he, along with Justin Barrett, uh, put in a massive application for a grant from the John Templeton Foundation, based here at the Ian Ramsey Center, to look at the cognitive science of religion and its philosophical implications. And that was successful, and it led to, I think, a very good project from 2007 to 2011, looking at this whole field, not just the science, but also the philosophical implications. He was one of the co-directors, and it led to a publication with uh, Ashgate in 2014. And looking back on that, I think that in many ways was the, the beginning of the Ian Ramsey Center's decision to begin to try and host large research projects. So in many ways, I personally want to thank Roger for, in effect, uh, redirecting the Ian Ramsey Center, not merely in terms of its engagement with major questions, but also in terms of actually doing the research, which might, I think, uh, open up better understandings of things. So that's the first point I want to make. But I also want to say how much I appreciate reading the book we'll be talking about this afternoon. There are copies at the back, and I know Roger will be delighted to sign these uh, at the end of this lecture. Roger has written many books. Uh, if you look at his CV, you will notice there are many on philosophy, particularly the area of freedom and religion. But if I may say so, this is the book he wrote, which I particularly valued. And when I read it, uh, I read it in, in a typescript form, I think there are two things that really stood out for me. First of all, this is a very relevant question. Is reality limited to what the natural scientists can disclose, or is the horizon, is the, the, the frame, so to speak, bigger than that? And of course, there are a whole series of questions here about the limits of science, about the place of religion and things like this. And the thing I particularly appreciate about this book was not simply that it engaged these questions, but it engaged them, and this is my second point, in a very accessible way. The whole field of science and religion has its scholarly dimension. I want to emphasize how important that is. But I think there's also a secondary aspect, which is connecting up with debates in our wider culture. And very often, the language of pure scholarship doesn't make that connection all that well. And as I read this typescript, the thing that delighted me was not simply that this, this is clearly a book by someone who knew his stuff at the intellectual level, but also someone who was able to pitch this at a level that would engage a wider readership. And so for me, this is, I think, one of Roger's best books. It, it is not simply that it engages very good questions and engages them very well, but also engages them in a very accessible way. And I find myself regularly recommending this book as a, as a very good, um, in effect, counterblast to the scientism, the view that science is able to determine everything that does seem to be coming the default position in our culture. It shouldn't be the default position because it's so obviously wrong. But in many ways, it just has become so because of influential voices dominating the media. 
And so I'm absolutely delighted that Roger has written this book. He's written it very well. I hope it gets a very wide readership. But I take the greatest of pleasure in inviting Roger now to talk to us about this book. You notice I've been very careful not to say too much about it. And that's because why on earth uh, should I speak about this when we have the author here? As you all know, postmodern theory talks a lot about the death of the author. I think those, those are slightly premature rumors. I think that there is nothing better than hearing an author talk about his book because it, in effect, makes, lets you make a connection between the text and the writer. And I know we're going to have a very enjoyable afternoon. So will you please welcome Roger Trigg to introduce this wonderful book. Roger, over to you. Thank you very much, Alistair, for that very, very generous introduction. Now, can science explain everything? I think it's one of the views that some people unthinkingly just accept, that any explanation nowadays has to be scientific. As Alice has just said, it's seeped into the very depths of our culture, uh, even to the effect of affecting the way in which laws are drawn up so that religion is regarded as something subjective. It's a preference. I mean, some people like to go to church on Sundays, some people like to play golf. Uh, but religion isn't saying anything about the world because the only thing that says anything about the world is science. And now that raises a question about what is science, which I'll come on to. Uh, but it limits the question by definition. Now, uh, my interest in these things goes back to, well, when I was an undergraduate and before that. But when I was an undergraduate here in Oxford, uh, logical positivism, so-called, uh, was very much still in the ascendancy. Logical positivism descended from the Vienna circle of the pre-war Vienna intellectual milieu. And uh, A.J. Eyre, who was in my college, new college here, um, was very much the person who popularized it in England, both before and after the Second World War. And logical positivism just says, really, that what is real is what science can verify. Sometimes it went even further and said what is meaningful is what can be checked by science. So if you can't check something scientifically, if you don't know what would prove it, one way or another scientifically, then it's just a meaningless string of words, ooga booga bonk. I mean, whatever you're saying. So if I say, uh, for instance, there's a heifer lump at the bottom of the garden, and you'd say, oh, well, that's interesting. Well, how would I know if I saw one? And I'd say, I don't know, but I know there is one. And uh, uh, well, obviously, there is something wrong about that. Uh, but if you extend that to the whole of human experience, so that if, in fact, you can't experience something, it isn't real, uh, then, of course, that does rule out a very considerable part of a human uh, life. And uh, one of the problems about the verification theory is that it had, had it really in for metaphysics, so-called, anything beyond science. Uh, but then awkward people said, well, yes, uh, let's say that you can only understand things you can verify. Now, how do we verify the verification theory? You can't. It's, uh, now, what is it? I remember once asking Fred Eyre how you, uh, he would answer that question. He said earlier, well, it's an axiom. Now, an axiom is a starting point, but really, if you don't like the starting point because it rules out too many things, perhaps it's better to have a different axiom. So it doesn't actually solve very much that. It's a rather arbitrary thing to decide. But anyway, logical positivism, uh, the idea that science is everything, certainly was ruling the roost. Um, I was driving down into Oxford one day, uh, and uh, I stopped for a cup of tea in Woodstock, just I was coming to a seminar, and... Uh, a very nosy old lady sat with me and said, well, where are you going? What are you doing? And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I said, well, I'm going to a philosophy seminar in Oxford. And she said, oh, yes, she said, uh, my nephew, and she was quite old, my nephew is a philosopher in Oxford, and she gave me his name. And then she looked at me piercingly, and she said, he's a logical positivist, you know. And I said, oh, yes, I suppose that was a description of him. And she said, well, it's not very nice, is it? <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And to people of a previous generation, logical positivism was, in fact, very threatening because it ruled out religion, it ruled out ethics, it ruled out aesthetics, anything that you couldn't prove in a scientific laboratory. Now, why does this matter nowadays? 
Um, well, I, I mentioned very briefly later uh, the work of Richard Dawkins. But Richard Dawkins, I think, has been very influenced by this. So you notice in his books how he assumes that all evidence is scientific evidence. If you can't find any scientific evidence, that means there isn't any evidence. And, and that's just taking the positivist view that science explains everything. There's another philosophical strand besides positivism and empiricism that work comes in here, and that's the whole question of pragmatism. Now, this really comes more from America than from uh, this country, and uh, in a sense, I suppose, Americans like to have their feet on the ground. But the idea of pragmatism is, well, what's meaningful really is what works, and in a sense, it meshes in with the view of a lot of working scientists who quite reasonably say, well, science works, so we're not interested in all this philosophy. Why bother about philosophy? I know what I'm doing, and it works. Um, is that enough? And that's really one of the themes of my book. Is that enough, or do we need some kind of justification? Do we need to step back from science and just say, well, yes, we think science works, but why? And does it really Again, a good example of this kind of attitude and this disdain for metaphysics came in one of William James' books. He was uh, recounting how he was camping with friends in upstate New York. He went off for a walk and he came back and they were having an absolutely furious row. And he said, well, what are you arguing about? Well, they said, there's this squirrel you see and it's going round the trunk of a tree and we're going round after it. Now we're having an argument as to whether... Uh, as we go around the tree, the squirrel keeps the tree trunk away from uh, the, the, uh, 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 keeps the tree trunk between the squirrel and us. You notice squirrels even Oxford do that, and you'll find. And they said, now what the question is, as we go around the tree and the squirrel goes around the tree, are we going around the squirrel? And uh, one side said yes, we are, and the other side says no, we're not. And William James got furious, and he said, look. The facts are the same, whatever you will describe it as. Um, what difference does it make? And he says, metaphysics is like that. We all agree about the facts, and we just disagree about the interpretation. And the interpretation is nothing. It doesn't add anything at all. It's a waste of time. So why bother with metaphysics? So again, from pragmatism and from empiricism, you get this attack on standing back from science and saying, why? And yet, and yet, you see, I'm worried about what has to be the case for science to be successful. Why is it that we think that science is successful? Is it really successful? Um, do we, in fact, live in an apparent sea of order in a great ocean of disorder? Is it all an illusion? How can we do science? Now, again, the working scientist may often say, oh, I'm not interested in that. We just get on with it, and it works. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid that philosophers sometimes aren't quite so easily convinced, and they want to say why. Now, this lecture series is looking particularly at naturalism, and one of the questions I look at in my book is the nature of naturalism, the difference between methodological naturalism, which is, I suppose, by and large, the uh, working methods of science uh, that you've got to look, have blinkers on and say, well, the kind of explanations we're looking for are of this kind rather than that. We're not going to be satisfied with saying, well, it's the fairies at the bottom of the garden that did it. We want something a bit more hard-headed than that. But naturalism, uh, restricting our vision to scientific method, also then verges into a metaphysical thesis. And by metaphysical, it's not just saying this is how we do science and we're not looking at other kinds of explanations. Naturalism, as a metaphysical say, uh, thesis, is saying this is the only kind of reality there can be. Uh, and we're back with the idea that science explains everything because everything that exists, the only reality that there is, is what there is within the scope of science. If it's beyond the scope of science, it isn't there. Um, the Vienna Circle, I mentioned them earlier, um, and I was influenced by them, um, used to say there is no insoluble ribble, riddle. And they said that because if it was insoluble, it was a meaningless question. And this was absolutely circular. If science can't solve it, it's not insoluble because it's meaningless. But this restricts things very much. 
and probably restricts things to the here and now. But naturalism, I want to argue, if it's more than just a gesture towards the kind of methodology that science should adopt, if it's saying the kind of reality there is, is undoubtedly making what I regard as metaphysical claims. It's standing outside science and talking about what science is up to, talking about what is within the scope of science and saying that actually there is nothing beyond what science can explain. In fact, it's the modern version of materialism. I suppose materialism has gone out of fashion because of the difficulty of defining what matter is. Matter seems to, in a sense, dissolve uh, as we get down and down to more and more below the subatomic level. But uh, certainly because no longer we can think of matter as being nice little hard billiard balls and very, very small, uh, it's only energy or something even more diffuse, uh, people will say, well, therefore, let's stick to naturalism, and that's what the reality is what the natural sciences says there it is. But as I said, I think that this is just a question of uh, metaphysics, because it's beginning to say not just this is how we do science, but actually we don't have to worry about there being anything beyond science, because there is nothing beyond science. We don't have to stand outside science to justify it, Indeed, we can't stand outside science to justify it. But I think that leaves us with a tremendous worry. Because if you say there is no such thing as the justification of science, why are we doing science? Now, that may seem a funny question, because uh, a lot of people do, do do science. It's a good way of earning a living, perhaps, for some. It's a very fascinating thing to do. But then, I mean, some people can earn a living playing cricket, and uh, that's a fascinating thing to do. Why is science in the business of truth and cricket not? Now, I use cricket because, uh, of course, the later Wittgenstein talked about language games and forms of life, and he would be quite happy about thinking of science, in a sense, as being a bit like a game. It has its own structure, its own rules, and you play it and accept the rules, or you don't. But why play the game? What is the justification? Interestingly enough, uh, Wittgenstein, in uh, various of his later works, was very, very unable to justify the practice of science. Why do physics? Why believe in physics, not oracles? Um, he found that you can't stand outside your system of belief. And this, to my mind, is a kind of relativism. It's just saying that, well, this is our system. These are the rules we play by. And that's just what we do. We do. We play that because we're us. But that isn't good enough. Why do science? I mentioned truth, but is science in the business of truth? Now, what I'm arguing really is that we dare not take science for granted. And the fact that we dare not take it for granted is rather shown by the fact that there are many people nowadays in the philosophical world um, particularly on the continent, but I've already mentioned the later Wittgenstein, so there are many others as well, who would not see science as the be-all and end-all. They wouldn't be naturalists. They'd see science as just one form of group activity, one practice. Postmodernism, I think, is a good example of this, which takes different traditions, different communities, and regards what happens within each as being perfectly viable for them. But you can't stand outside and have any kind of God's eye view. There's no such thing as dispassionate reason, no such thing as an objective truth to decide. You're within a conceptual scheme the whole time. Uh, I was reading a, a, a new book by a postmodernist called Gianni Vatimo, an Italian. Um, and he quite explicitly embraces a form of nihilism that takes the criteria of truth to be historical and not metaphysical, not tied to the ideal of demonstration, but orientated towards persuasion. In other words, you don't show what's true, you just get other people to agree. And from that point of view, he says, truth is a matter of rhetoric, of shared acceptance, as is the case even for the scientific proposition, which has value insofar as it's verified by others, by the scientific community, and nothing more. In other words, Science has validity insofar as scientists believe it's true. But why should other people believe it's true outside science? 
And he's saying, well, you can't. I mean, it's something that's valid within a community, and that's all. And he makes this position crystal clear by saying, the conclusion is not that we're in agreement we've been discovered because we've discovered truth, something there outside. Rather, we say that we found truth when we're in agreement. Agreement creates truth. Truth uh, is not something uh, that um, uh, is discovered. So, in a sense, it's a matter of coherence, not correspondence, to put it in a philosophical context. So we've got to actually face up to that, because I actually believe science is in the business of telling us what's true. My only complaint is that I think it's not the only source of truth, and indeed it needs foundations for us to rely on it. It's not enough to say, well, it's what we do, or it's a game we play, it's what scientists agree about. Uh, well, that's true, but the further point is it's showing us something about the real world. Now, even if you were to define, in fact, truth in terms of science, and uh, many people, I think even pragmatists, have tried to do this, a further question arises. Now, C.S. Peirce, another American pragmatist, wanted to talk about an, idealis an idealized science, a scientific millennium when all the facts are in, when everybody agrees. And for him, in a sense, that's what we're aiming towards. But... Uh, that itself looks very metaphysical to me because it isn't something that's here and now available. It's something that might be available one day in principle, perhaps. And that's not at all clear. The well-known philosopher of science, Karl Hempel, um, produced a paradox 30-odd years ago when he says, well, when you want to talk about physics, the language of which physics is meant, is it physics now, or physics as it one day might be, one day could be? Because contemporary physics will change. And I think one of the points about science that we must always remember is that science is provisional and tentative, and it's working towards something. And we've got to be very clear in our minds as to what we're working towards. The more you idealize physics and say, well, it's not what we're thinking now, but it's what, when all the facts are in, we will think, uh, the more you import an ontology of which perhaps we ourselves will never know anything, and perhaps no human ever will. And that itself is a suspiciously metaphysical concept. And if you think of metaphysics as something that's beyond physics, and I'll come back to that notion in a moment, uh, nevertheless, that's something, I think, uh, that raises the question that perhaps it's beyond our current reach and you can't define things within our current reach. In fact, if you make science totally anthropocentric, as empiricists tended to do, it's all actual and possible observations and experiences, uh, then you relate reality so much to human capabilities uh, that somehow or other it looks very implausible. The world isn't just what we can know about. It's much grander than that. Science, in fact, has a universal reach. Um, and I mean that in all kinds of ways. I mean, it uh, applies everywhere, in Moscow, in Beijing, in Washington, in London. What's discovered in one place applies in another. It also applies across our universe, perhaps, or conceivable universes, um, that it, it's what's discovered here is valid there. What's discovered now will be valid then. And coupled with this, I think, is an idea of the unity of science, too, that science itself has to uh, cohere together. There will, be, in the end, in principle, be only one complete science because... There is only one reality. Now, reality comes in very many forms and at very many different levels, and perhaps different parts of science will grasp different levels, and that's why I think the reductionism of some kinds of naturalism is very dangerous. Uh, it can't all be reduced to physics. But nevertheless, the world is one, so you can't have a science where this bit's contradicting with that bit and it doesn't matter. Um, one philosopher of physics talks about a dappled world. Well, 
it all depends what you mean by that, but it does matter if you begin to get contradictions between different sciences. Uh, so so uh, for, uh, all science in the end ultimately must cohere, although coherence itself is not sufficient. Even naturalism itself, which I've argued does force us back to metaphysics, also relies on mathematics. And I think this raises a big question as well about the nature of mathematics and how that fits into the scheme of things. You notice a lot of physicists and a lot of scientists are happy to use mathematics, and they seem to use it in a way that suggests that perhaps their equations actually fit onto reality. Indeed, the whole final theory that some uh, physicists look for seems one that can be expressed in very basic mathematical form. So math seems to unlock the secrets of the universe. But why? Again, what has to be the case for mathematics to be able to unlock the secrets of the universe? Why should the universe be such that mathematics can take hold of it? Now, it's talking about the universe, but of course a complication now is that many physicists are quite happy to talk about an infinite number of universes. Um, in the book, I talk about, for instance, Max Teg Tegmark, who I suppose might be an extreme example of this, because he thinks that all mathematical possibilities actually exist. They're actual. So that all mathematically possible universes exist. Now, this is a very good way, incidentally, of dealing with the question, why is it that we exist? Why is this universe so special? How has it developed in such a way that it's produced human beings? There is in physics a thing called the anthropic principle, something you may be familiar with, which talks about how the real existence of humanity is really meshed in with some of the basic physical constants of the universe, that if the world had been very different at the very beginning, life could never have developed, and particularly our forms of life could never. So that somehow or other, I remember a very famous physicist, John Wheeler, saying to me, uh, the universe saw us coming. Uh, it seems an extraordinary thing to say, but nevertheless, uh, that our existence is tied up with the very basic nature of the universe. Now, why is that? It seems very extraordinary. Uh, it's made some people use that as a theistic argument. How do you get out of that if you don't want to believe in God? The answer is to say there are an infinite number of universes. So it's not surprising we're in this one because any of the fact that we exist shows it's possible. Any possibility exists. Um, now, I find that a rather horrifying prospect in that it seems to me an infinite number of universes is hardly simpler or less metaphysical than the notion of God. So, I mean, if, you're, if your answer to a question is an infinite number of universes... Uh, I think you've got a big problem myself, uh, because I can't think of any more profligate multiplication of entities. I mean, uh, as a philosopher, a logician, I was always taught that Occam's razor was very important. You get rid of superfluous entities. You don't just multiply um, A to explain B to explain C to, if you don't need them all. But to talk about an infinite number of universes just brings everything, and it doesn't therefore actually explain anything. It's just whatever happens, happens. Why does this happen? Well, it happens. Why does that happen? It happens. I mean, you actually give up on the notion of explanation. And that, I think, is quite a, a serious suggestion and a serious problem. So, but, but anyway, w whether uh, you agree with an infinite number of universes or not, it's very difficult to say it's not a characteristically metaphysical view because the universes are, by definition, outside the reach of anything we can discover through our science. Uh, they're purely a rational construct. They may or may not exist, uh, but they may even be very, very different physically from our own, so you can't extrapolate from our physics, etc., uh, etc. Et I mean, it's actually a complete example of a metaphysical program gone wild. Still, uh, it's all based on mathematics and based on the assumption that mathematics reflects reality. Now, why? And what is it about reality? Why is it that reality should be so rational? Because mathematics seems to be a very rational activity, yet it's uh, basically the construction of the human mind. Why is it that it latches on to the world? So that's another big question, and I think that it's surprising how many uh, 
working scientists who eschew metaphysics get involved within their science in things that seem to me characteristically, as I've said, metaphysics. Well, as I've said, pragmatism and empiricism can't just be taken for granted. They make reality anthropocentric. It's the logical independence of physical reality from mind and understanding that gives science its point. It's because we're finding out things about the world. It's we're discovering. We're not constructing. And that means there is such a thing as scientific progress. We find out more gradually. There is such a thing as the discovery of truth. So, therefore, truth and reality must not be defined in terms of science. They are its justification. Crucially, the intrinsic rationality of the world and its apparent intelligibility to the human mind as well can't be taken for granted. I mean, always the, the, the assumption is, in both empiricism and pragmatism and so on, is that we just get to grips with the world and get on with it. But why is the world such that we can get to grips with it? I mean, the, the question of the intrinsic rationality of the world, the orderliness of the world, the kind of thing that can ground our faith in the future. Why is it like that? Some philosophers who can't answer that question want, in a sense, to just rule it out as illegitimate. But I think it's a very big question. Why is it that if there is an intrinsic rationality in the world that our minds seem to be able to latch onto it? Why is the human mind such that we can understand the basic secrets of the universe? And this goes back as well to the question of mathematics. Why is it that our mathematics can do that? So, I mean, trusting the rationality and intelligibility of the world is itself a characteristically metaphysical view. It's standing outside science, beyond physics, to justify it. So reality, we have to assume, is objective. It is there. There is a reality to be investigated that's taken for granted. It's, to a large extent, predictable and orderly. It's accessible to human reason. Why? Now, uh, I haven't been saying very much in this about religion and about God, and in fact, I don't in the book. And I didn't want to because I, I wasn't meant to be a direct argument for religion. Uh, but quite clearly, I'm opening a door that some people want to keep slammed shut. Uh, that you can see how desperate people are sometimes to keep religion out by and bringing up an infinite number of universes. And uh, you find that people, therefore, are very reluctant to allow metaphysics in precisely because for them the big metaphysical issue is God and the creation of, by God of the world. So the minute one says perhaps one can get beyond physics, the minute I'm asking questions about the rationality of the world, the intelligibility of the world, I'm raising questions that I do recognize can be given a theistic answer. Now, they don't have to be. So I would hope that philosophers can read the book without feeling that they're being dragooned into a religious view. But there is no doubt about it that I'm raising a question that a religious view can meet. And why is the world accessible to human reason? Now, one quick answer would come from a group of philosophers and theologians I often quote that I, I rather like. And they were in the 17th century there at the beginning of modern science uh, in the Cambridge of Isaac Newton, um, the Cambridge Platonists, they were called. And uh, they were very important because, as I said, they were both at the roots of modern science and the roots of modern politics and views about human rights and so on. They influenced John Locke, who then went on to influence the founding of America and its constitutional theory, etc., etc. Uh, now, one of the slogans of the Cambridge Platonists was, reason is the candle of the Lord. Not a great searchlight. It's only a candle. It doesn't show us everything, but it illuminates something. And because it's been implanted in us, they said, by the creator of the universe, therefore it's not surprising that we have a bit of the reason that enables us to see the intrinsic rationality implanted in the world <coughs> by the creator. So that would be a, a, a beginnings of a theistic answer to this question of why the world is in fact uh, as it is, uh, that it was the creation of God. 
as I said, I wasn't in fact um, wanting to get involved in the theism and uh, atheism argument, but I was reading a blog from America yesterday. It was rather flattering. It's, uh, it's about uh, my book, and it's, uh, it, the blog is Five Top Science Books of the Spring. So mine, and mine was the first one there, so I thought, oh, I better read this. And, <laughs> but I was interested to see that the reviewer um, talked about its friendly tone and willingness to address atheism in a non-combative non way. And I was interested in that because I didn't think that was what I was doing explicitly. And uh, it's interesting that, that they immediately jumped to that conclusion. And that's why I say I, they do it because I'm opening a door that some people don't want to open. and Someone like Richard Dawkins certainly wouldn't. So the atheist-theist debate is obviously one thing that metaphysics can uh, allow. Um, one of the things that I think we must assume in when talking about uh, metaphysics is that we're talking about what lies beyond physics. I mean, of course, the term metaphysics comes from Aristotle. It was the book built off, written or coming after the physics. Meta is, it carries with it both the, the, the idea in Greek of after and beyond. And if you think of it as beyond physics... Uh, there are two ways in which it can be, be beyond physics, and there was a review of the, this book in the Times Literary Supplement last week and raising uh, this point, and I think it is interesting to see there are two ways in which you can go beyond physics. One is by positing a reality that may one day be within the scope of physics but is not now. And I think even some uh, philosophers of science have shut the door even on that, uh, that they think, as with, I said with Hempel's paradox, that they think in terms of what is within the scope of present-day physics, not one day's possibility. So science can change and gradually increase. And the idea of scientific progress reaching out to something beyond where we are should make us very reluctant to say everything's defined in present-day terms. But, of course, that's really in a way to just extend naturalism and say, well, all right, physics can change very radically, but it's still one day what physics will deal with. And I think there is also another meaning of metaphysics, that actually it can deal and should be dealing with realities that are never going to be within the scope of physics. Indeed, I suppose you could say that mathematics itself, used by physics, um, is dealing with entities that, I mean, the status of mathematical entities is a vexed matter for discussion, but they, uh, in fact, uh, could be entities that have to be used and invoked by physics but can't be explained in physical terms. Um, but uh, certainly physics itself can't exhaust the nature of reality, even in principle, even one day. So metaphysics opens the possibility of kinds of realities that physics can never reach, and I don't just mean alternative universes. So science is a noble expression of human reason, but it doesn't exhaust its capabilities, let alone explain it away. In the book I mention evolutionary epistemology, and that's one thing that scientists sometimes seize on to um, just as they try and explain a religion through the cognitive science of uh, religion, they sometimes want to explain our ability to know through the fact that we've evolved. I mean, if we didn't recognize great holes, we'd fall in them. If we didn't recognize predators, we might get eaten by a lion. Well, all right, that we, we, there's a certain uh, logic in that. We have evolved in a certain kind of world. But there are so many things that human reason is capable of that can't be explained in evolutionary terms. And philosophy, and indeed even the theory of evolution, I think, can't be explained in evolutionary terms. Why should one believe it? Um, unless it's a good way of selling books and uh, getting money, but uh, that doesn't explain its conceivable truth. So uh, the question is that science can't explain away human reason without cutting the ground from under itself. Uh, and we need a notion of realism of a world that doesn't depend on science but is there to give science its justification. Reality is a regulative principle. I think it's a bit more than that. We need to know something about it to enable science to be possible. So it's not just there as a thing in itself. It's something we can get to grips with. 
we can't just discover its rationality, but we need some assurance that we have the ability to do so. It was Einstein who said that the internally incomprehensible thing about the world is its comprehensibility. And we need more assurance that, in fact, we are understanding things that are really there. We presuppose the ability of science within science to give explanations, but we don't itself explain that deep fact. Like the way that mathematics seems to map the intrinsic rational st structure of the world, in the end, when we're doing science, we're inevitably faced with metaphysical questions about what is it that justifies this? Explanations are of the kind that can only come from beyond science. Otherwise, the only alternative is relativism and nihilism. And unfortunately, there are plenty of people invoking those nowadays. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard a, a very stimulating talk. And in a moment, I'm going to suggest we take a time of questions. And I'll walk around with the microphone. We want to record your questions so we can also record the answer. While you're thinking about what question you'd like to ask, I will simply make a comment, which is I think Roger brings out very, very clearly that there's sort of um, almost like the, the internal contradiction about this very anthropocentric view of um, what reality is. If reality is what human beings are capable of discovering, then reality changes over time. And the issue, therefore, is, is there actually a great big reality of which we are having an increasingly large but still very small grasp? Or is reality actually simply defined by what we can know? And it just seems to me that Roger's analysis brings out that there's this very tantalizing question as to whether reality is actually out there and we discover it, or whether actually it's what we have access to. And that's a fascinating question. But we have plenty of time for questions. I'm just going to ask you to put your hand up. And if you could put, say your question very clearly into the microphone, and then we can record Roger's response. Who would like to begin, please? We'll begin here. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I just wanted to pick you up on the question of separating the possibility of metaphysics in a secular sense, so not an atheistic sense, but rather not being concerned with religious questions or not having methodolo methodological concern with religious questions uh, from religious metaphysics. And this goes back to perhaps Kant and Hegel, you know, where Kant is trying to concern his metaphysical picture with within the bounds of mere reason. And obviously religion as such is more of a faith position compared to someone like Hegel who intrinsically bounds up God within his metaphysics. And I wondered if you had anything to say about whether that's a fruitful distinction to make uh, between religious metaphysics and secular metaphysics as understood, or whether it's at all possible in the first place. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm afraid I, I think metaphysics is just metaphysics. I, I think it's, it's about the possibility of religion, but I don't, I mean, if you say it's religious metaphysics, you've already answered a basic metaphysical question to get involved with it, haven't you? So, I mean, you, you were already in it and said, well, I've answered that question, so let's get on to these. I mean, some of the more basic metaphysical questions seem to me to be a, an ability of human reason to get to grips with things. Now, I've always wanted to uphold the ability of humans to reason, cross-culturally, cross-historically, um, that's why I've always been so opposed to relativism. I don't think we're totally culturally conditioned. And I think we can stand outside even our religion and talk about it without begging the question. We can even think about our religion as to whether it's justifiable or not. That's why I'm so against the views of religion that just reduce them to notions of personal preference or subjectivity. I think religion itself is claiming truth, and those claims to truth can be questioned, and I, they can be questioned by people who don't accept them, too. So I think one can ought to have a rational discussion. I don't mean that faith is just a matter of reason, but uh, it certainly involves reason. It always involves faith in something that must be rationally specified. So the idea of a religious metaphysics, uh, rather, I, I, it isn't the kind of metaphysics I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with things uh, from a philosophical point of view, which is, in a sense, one step back. Mm. I suppose my question was just framed in the sense of the book review you mentioned, even the mere suggestion of the possibility of studying metaphysics was almost a presupposition of a religious or non-atheistic background. 
Well, I think it, that's because some atheists have wanted to, in a sense, put all their money on science mm. and, and say, once you begin to try and justify science, and once you talk philosophically about science, that's opening the door to religion. But I think that's a, I mean, let me speak as a card-carrying philosopher for a moment. I mean, I get very cross about scientists who want to say it's the end of philosophy, science can explain everything, we don't need philosophy, and they write books that are full of philosophy showing why you don't need to do philosophy. Mm -hmm. And they accept that there is a reality, and, and they start talking about things that I think are characteristically philosophical. So, I, I mean, I think that you can't escape philosophy, and the only thing is, do you know you're doing it when you're doing it? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Trigg. I, I enjoyed the talk immensely. I wanted to ask just two related questions about the details of how you dealt with the uh, many worlds response to oh, the yes. fine-tuning argument. And I'm strongly inclined to, to agree with you, at least I want to agree with you, yeah. that uh, this response is a, an atrocious uh, a transgression of Occam's razor. But I, I, I wanted to, to ask about two things. So one is that... Uh, you suggested that the reply was, well, the world seems to have had to be very precisely uh, ordered for us to exist, and yet we do. That seems to give some argument for theism. But if you have an infinite number of worlds, then it becomes far less, uh, 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 far, far less of a, a reasonable piece of evidence for theism. Now... It's not clear that we need to go to an infinite number of worlds. I mean, in fact, it's clear we don't need to. So uh, suppose it were one in a billion, the chance of uh, uh, there being a universe suitable for human life, then you'd only need a billion to make it quite plausible. And we, we know that there are lots of extremely big numbers, smaller than infinity, uh, 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 which will do justice to any uh, otherwise extremely improbable uh, uh, calculation. So that was one thing. Maybe it seems less implausible when we're just talking about a very large number, as I think maybe Derek Parfit does in his essay on why there's something rather than nothing. The second thing I wondered about was you said that positing all these other worlds is, is already doing something paradigmatically metaphysical because, by definition, these worlds can't be observed from ours. And I wondered if uh, a canny naturalist wouldn't want to push back against that and say, well, even in quite a narrow understanding of naturalism, we accept that there's observation and then there are theoretical virtues like parsimony and elegance, uh, which is why, for instance, we uh, posit the existence of a colossal amount of dark matter that we're not able to observe, but which allows us to have a theory of the way physics works, which is extremely elegant. And likewise, they might say, well, if, it's, if it uh, gives our theory greater elegance or greater parsimony, probably the former, given all these extra worlds, then it's not metaphysical in, in any uh, obvious sense to posit these extra worlds. Yes. Uh, I mean, w one of the... W well, can I say, d just I think, on, if you have a, a, a smaller number of universes... I mean, Tegmark actually wanted to say there's an infinite number yeah. because, because for, for mathematical reasons. Uh, but if you say, well... It's not every conceivable universe, not every possible universe, but there's a more limited number, just a billion perhaps, and, uh, and you'd say, well, it's not surprising we're one of them. Uh, but we wouldn't have to be one of them. I mean, we could still be, I mean, it, what was, it is still a fact needing the explanation that this universe is one of the billion. It could have been one of those that was outside the billion in a sense that was never there. Um, I mean, the point about Tegmark's explanation is that he doesn't need to say, well, why, why is this one here then? Because it, it, if, it, if it's possible, it does exist. I, I mean, uh, I, some people like to put a number on the fine-tuning argument, and they say for a universe to exist with uh, the conditions necessary for something like human life, you'd need initial conditions uh, which are improbable to the degree of one in some ex enormously big number. Now... If you have that number of universes, it seems it no longer looks improbable. So if you're, if you're willing to accept a probabilistic explanation, that might be enough, mightn't it? Well, yeah, but, but we're still back with the metaphysical question because, I mean, this is where I suppose m m all the teaching of, of air and the verification theory of meaning begins to creep back in me because I think, well, perhaps he was on to something because if you can start multiplying universes, even if it's only a billion other universes, which are by definition outside the reach, we're not talking about sub-regions of this universe, uh, 
we're talking about total, if there are universes, we're talking about things that are totally separate, subject to totally different physical laws by definition, really, because they've got different uh, starting points, etc. So they're absolutely different, absolutely inaccessible, uh, we're all virtually inconceivable by us. Now, why would you say they exist? Um, well, I mean, you might have reasons, but all I'm saying is that what you're saying exists must be, by any normal standard of the word, metaphysical, because it's got nothing to do with our present physics at all. I mean, there's nothing in our physics. I mean, you can talk about subregions of this universe, and you can talk about little universes detaching from itself or something. I mean, you, there are ways, and you can say, talk about the same physical laws producing different effects. But once you start saying there are different physical laws, different starting points, it, regions that are, are in principle inaccessible and are inexplicable by our science, well, that's not physics, that's metaphysics, surely. I mean, that's all I'm saying. Now, I'm, I'm not going to say these things don't exist. All I'm saying is we're now arguing on metaphysical ground that's not very different from talking about God anyway. Um, so, so you can't just say this is science and that isn't. And you can't, um, I mean, the scientistic approach really is claiming a privileged position for a certain kind of reason. And all I'm saying is that they're actually retreating into something that doesn't, in fact, entitle them to that privileged position, I think. Uh, um, you, the, you did raise another point, I think, didn't you? Oh, it was just about whether them being unobservable means that it's metaphysical when, when we have other theoretical virtues like uh, elegance. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah but, but you're still positing something that's beyond physics. Um, well, one of the things you did touch on, of course, which I think is incredibly important, is that nowadays we're more and more aware that scientific theories are underdetermined by the data. Now, empiricists always thought you could logically deduce from empirical observations, theories, and so on. Now, it, particularly from the 1960s on, people began to be aware that even given the same data you, that you could produce different theories. I remember hearing um, the very uh, famous philosopher of science, Quine, from Harvard, um, talking about uh, looking at Loch Ness and seeing a, a series of sinuous shapes going along. Now, he said it could be one monster or a little school of dolphins or something jumping in unison. Now, you might perhaps be able to check further, but you might not if they proceed into the distance. But anyway, that's an example of how the data underdetermine which theory you produce. Are there several animals there or just one? And now we're getting more and more into that kind of area. And the question is, how far can you get from the empirical base and still say that what you're doing is science? And where, at what point do you get so far that, that it's metaphysics? And I, I think that, that scientists are sometimes inclined to say, well, it's because, it, because we're doing it, it must be science. And that's, I query that. Thank you very much. You've, you've talked a great deal in your lecture about rash, um, reason, which I sort of equate rightly or wrongly with rationality. And there's a kind of general assumption out there that science is rational, reasonable, through and through, and that maths is kind of, you know, rationality just laid out in front of you. But in, the reality is, as we all know, that that's not true, that science is full of... Um, things that are not strictly speaking rational. And Newton himself said, you know, all big ideas begin with a guess, and a guess is really what Popper meant by a hypothesis. And when people, scientists judge what's true, they actually use a sense of beauty, as Dirac, you know, the beauty of the equations, and so on, and so on, and so on. And actually what really matters in science, as in everything else, is the intuition of the scientist. And I'm wondering what you would say in your book about intuition. It plays a huge part in religion, obviously, but where does intuition fit into your view of how human beings understand things and where does intuition come from? Yes. Uh, I mean, I didn't talk about it in this book, uh, which is a fairly short book. But uh, one problem, of course, is that you might say the context of discovery is different from the context of justification in science. So how scientists get to a theory is one thing, and how it's then justified might be another. And there is a kind of rational reconstruction to try and justify a theory, even though uh, th they may have come to it in a moment when they were stepping on a bus. 
but they're not going to justify it to their colleagues by saying, I was just getting on the seven, number seven bus. And if you get on the number seven bus, you will think the same. Uh, it, it isn't working like that. They've got to actually uh, somehow show how they can demonstrate it to their colleagues and perhaps using reproducible experiments or, or observations or whatever. Um, so science does aspire to be something that can be checked and verified in that way. Uh, so there is a rationality there. But, I mean, I agree that, I mean, the, I'm sure the greatest scientists aren't just deducing theories from observations or anything. They have great leaps of imagination. But in a way, this is where I think metaphysics even comes in science, that it, it allows you to think about what could be possible. And that allows you to leap beyond where you are now. Um, the pragmatist philosopher C.S. Peirce always used to say, start from where you are. But in a way, you've got to think about what, where you could get, which is very different. So you've got to think of possibilities that are almost unimaginable. And you, so mm. the greatest scientists can do that. And of course, I think the greatest scientists actually are the ones that think philosophically. Mm. Um, can I just make a follow-up there? Because I, mean, I agree with what you say, of course. But in the end, however much evidence you collect, as you said, the, uh, the you know the um, idea of what is actually true is, is undetermined, underdetermined mm. by the data. Yeah. And in the end, no amount of mathematical formulas are necessarily going to convince anybody, even the person that produced them. And in the end, when a scientist decides that something true, it's a kind of aesthetic response, always. And I find that interesting and mysterious and inescapable. Yes. yes. I mean, the elegance of equations, the beauty of the, of the universe, and all these things enter in. But And, of course, that brings in extraneous considerations in a sense that may come even from religion, I suppose. Um, but but I, I think a hard-headed scientist w wouldn't want to prove a scientific theory uh, to his colleagues just by saying, look how beautiful it is, would they? They'd want to be able to try and provide a bit more data than that, even though in his heart of hearts he thought, that's why I'm drawn to it. Take an organizer's uh, privilege to, to have a second comment. I just yes. wanted to, to mention, because it amused me, that uh, when Richard Dawkins was debating with Rowan Williams, who was then still, I think, Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, with Anthony Kenny as chair over who had the uh, best view of what the world's like, it's interesting you can find the video online, but it does conclude in a debate over whose view of the world is more beautiful. And I, I think the Ian Ramsey Center might have been involved in filming this or setting up. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The trouble with that is, of course, so many kind of more tougher-minded scientists will think beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so they think it's all subjective anyway, so they're going to scoff at that. Mm. Well, uh, uh, if we're talking about uh, organizers' privilege, I might uh, yes. help myself to it as well. I, yes. uh, have a question. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, verification, verificationism, uh, you can you can interrogate by asking whether whether it can be verified, and of course it can't. And uh, all, all other theories uh, which attempt to abandon uh, all external uh, sources of justification for them and just be just be self-sufficient um, have a similar problem. In fact, you mentioned pragmatism. You can mm. ask of pragmatism whether it's pragmatic. Quite. Um, and uh, also of uh, later Wittgenstein's idea of language games where he asks, uh, what's the point of playing the science game? Well, you can ask, uh, what's the point of playing Wittgenstein's game? I mean, <laughs> why, is he, why, why would we want to go along with Wittgenstein? Yeah play that one yeah um, but but uh, these all in that sense are anthropomorphic uh, but they also attempt to um, uh, uh, get another thing uh, <coughs> down, which is that of uh, reliability so if you don't uh, rely on some sort of external perspective for the justification of uh, uh, your <coughs> predicted outcomes for um, experiments in science, for, um, I don't know, something that is practically uh, useful for you, um, then you're building a theory, and this is something that many people want to achieve, which is reliable in that sense. Uh, without, uh, without appealing to anything external, you can know straight away uh, that something that you've established is repeatable in all circumstances. Now, isn't, isn't that a problem uh, for a theory that does uh, not attempt to 
be self-sustaining as far as its justification is concerned? What, that, that, that it isn't repeatable? That, it's, that, it's, that it's, it has a problem with reliability. I mean, so yes. for example, if you take, if, if you take a wildly opposite example, for example, uh, uh, a religious metaphysics, many people, scientists, for example, complain that it's not reliable as far as its predictions of uh, 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 events in the world are concerned. So if you, take, if you take a reading of the Bible and you go out into the world, um, you might find yourself in distressing circumstances, whereas if you take a scientific uh, view of the world, you might avoid uh, quite a lot of those. It provides a much more reliability. But I would say, as a philosopher, what, what does this reliability come? Uh, where does it rest? Um, how do you know it's reliable? Is it only apparent? Why should it? Why should there be this reliability? Why is the world? And this is the question I'm wrestling with all the time. Why is the world orderly and reliable? Um, science assumes it is, and so that's what makes science possible. Mm -hmm. But if you once start to say what has to be the case for science to take place and you say, well, the world has to be of this character, that character, then that raises the question, why? And uh, um, obviously, the, the, the reliability of science itself is something I think that can, can't just be taken in its own terms. Mm. <coughs> thank, thank you, thank you, Roger. I was very interested in the review of, of your book that uh, it was assumed that um, uh, when metaphysics comes in, it's automatically about God talk yes. um, and uh, similarly uh, I think people, people associate with metaphysics talk about soul ultimate causes and so on um, what I've tended to find in teaching is um, to try ask very simple uh, to ask about very simple things for which a scientific answer cannot be given one of my favorite being is Pluto a planet um, which was a, a wonderful example of astronomers a few years ago all having to become Aristotelian philosophers yeah. as they debated um, the genus of a planet. Are there any other favorite ways in which you break the spell, so to speak, um, simple questions that you put to people to show that metaphysics comes into daily life and ordinary stuff, as well as the big stuff of um, universes, multiverses, and God? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, obviously it enters into issues about morality as well, I think, because one of the great challenges of the verification theory, that kind of thing, was that, that it actually reduced morality to either just the expression of emotion or just something subjective. Now, and we've been talking a bit about beauty and elegance, um, and that's part of, our, in a sense, our everyday life. But is that just subjective? Um, if, there are so many parts of human experience that science actually, um, pursued in a very tough-minded way, seems to belittle. And are they worthy of so belittling it? I mean, is our morality, is it my view that human beings matter? Is that just a subjective feeling or a sign that I've been brought up in a certain way? Or might it be something very deep within us that is something much more important and a, a truth that even must hold science to account, that can't be discovered within science? And I mean, think that the idea that science itself should be constrained by other principles just raises the question, well, where, where do those principles come from? It isn't just people's preferences, dislikes. Uh, and an aesthetic appreciation of the world itself can be a driver for science. I mean, just the, the wonder and beauty of the world, even, even atheists talk about that. Um, but that seems to be something that is the beginning of a metaphysical approach. I mean, is it just me thinking, oh, I like that, or is it something deeper? Uh, Ralph referred to the uh, Dawkins debate in the Sheldonian Theatre. Yeah. One of my favourite moments from that debate was um, when Sir Anthony Kenny asked Richard Dawkins to define what he meant by simplicity, and then used the example of, of, a, of a, a simple electric, sh uh, electric shaver and uh, a naked blade, um, uh, what different kinds of simplicity involved. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm very interested in these kind of spell breakers. I mean, it's simple yeah. questions, not just about the big picture, like aesthetics and cosmos mm. and... But, but the little questions that really just bring down the whole house of cards. So, so uh, yes, any no, other I think, thoughts on that? Sure. Yes, no, I think it's important. But, but it, I mean, even the whole notion of science and the approaching the world in a scientific way are already the result of a certain philosophical approach, that this is how you bracket out certain things to try and get at these truths. And that itself was quite a, a considerable step forward, I suppose, in the history of human thoughts, that 
to be able to try and explain things scientifically. But the great problem was that then people were so transfixed by that kind of explanation that they forgot there were other kinds of explanation. Um, but I, I mean, of course, I'm as well would say that all philosophy is terribly important. And I mean, so that means the presuppositions you bring to bear on anything are usually philosophical. And the most dangerous moment is when you think you don't have any presuppositions because that means you're just taking things for granted that you ought to be questioning. So I suppose I'm too steeped in Socrates, but still. <laughs> well, I think that's a, that's a very good thought to, uh, yeah. to end with. Thank you very much, Professor Trudy, again, and thank right. you, everyone else, for coming. Uh, there are still some refreshments uh, at the back, and uh, you're welcome to discuss the ideas uh, that were raised today more over these, and uh, you're welcome to also attend the last of the series uh, of these seminars, which is going to take place at Blackfriars Hall uh, at 5 p.m. on the 2nd of June, uh, which is a Thursday. Uh, but before we adjourn, please uh, join me in thanking Professor Trigg again for his wonderful work.